thank you for all of our participants for um, joining us for this fabulous keynote session. I'm particularly excited about this keynote session. So we'll be hearing from a couple of different um, people who have experience in use cases of using Earth observation to make tangible impact on climate change. First of all, we will be hearing from um, Mark Matthews, CEO and founder of Cyano Lakes. Oh, I think my camera's frozen. Nevertheless, onwards. Following that, we'll be hearing from um, Nick Suter, who is joining us from Conservation International. And then we will hear from Professor Roland Barkey and Andang Suryan Soma, who will be joining us from the University of Hasanuddin and speaking about, all three will be speaking about these use cases. So these will hopefully give you an idea of some of the sorts of things that can be done, the potential of Earth observation for climate smart innovation. So I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you now, Mark, to take us away. Thank you. All right, great. I'm going to try to uh, share my screen quickly. You can just, oh, okay. It looks like you need to grant permission. Sorry, one second. I think I can sort that out for you. Sorry. No, it's actually on my side. Um, Let me know if... Um, need help uh, uh rosny i i'm just going to quickly log out and log in again sorry sure okay all right no so problems it'll only take a few seconds sorry no worries i'll let you in thank you thanks for your patience everyone we'll have um mark joining us to provide his keynote in a couple of seconds So as you heard from both of our keynotes yesterday, Alison Rose from Geoscience Australia and Dr. Graham Koenig from Frontier SI, Earth observation has a lot of potential and a lot of power to be able to be used for various many use cases when it comes to climate resilience. There are a wide range of ways that you can use this information for understanding trends through time, for understanding what needs attention where. And um, with yeah. that, I'll hand you back over to Mark. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you, you. We can, can see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Roshni, for facilitating today. And um, so my name is Dr. Mark Matthews. I'm the founder and CEO of Sino Lakes. And what we do is we provide professional apps for monitoring cyanobacteria blooms using satellites. So um, as far as I understand, um, the people who are attending this course is the idea is to come up with applications uh, for satellite um, Earth observation and to try that out and see if we can start new businesses, see if we can um, create jobs, see if we can create value to other businesses um, uh, from Earth observation data. Um, so my role today is just to share a little bit about our story as Sinolakes, not necessarily to pitch Sinolakes to you, but to give you an overview of what we do, and then I'll share some insights and learning um, as, I, as I go along, which hopefully will be helpful to you um, on your journey as you are trying to, you know, uh, come up with innovative solutions uh, for a variety of applications using EO data. All right, so um, let's start at the beginning, which is with a problem, right? So any, any solution requires there to be a, a problem. So this picture is quite a famous image captured by National Geographic, or it appeared in the National Geographic at least, of a lake in China with a severe bloom of something called cyanobacteria. And um, you can see the a magnificent array of colors um, of this, what we call surface scum on the water 
um, surface um, here, these blue colors, these green colors, um, and these are actually pigments which have been bleached by the sun. Um, and so you've got these blue pigments called phycobilly proteins, these beautiful blue pigments which come out of the cyanobacteria cells, which as long as, along with the, the green pigments, which is the chlorophyll. So what really is the problem here? Well, of course, we've got climate warming. We've got pollution coming into lakes, mainly from human anthropogenic sources like sewerage or effluent. And this is driving eutrophication of the world's lakes. And if it gets severe enough, this is the sort of stuff that, that happens um, in this picture. And the primary issue with cyanobacteria is that three things, there's taste, toxins, and odor. So the problem with cyanobacteria is that it, when you come to treat that water for human usage, um, water companies spend a lot of money treating that water to remove toxins, taste, and odor. So that's your primary use case, if you have to say, you know, what is, what is the, who's the primary customer when you're starting to develop and unpack this problem? What's your water companies treating this water? Then there's another massive application in terms of your public health. So cyanobacteria produce toxins, which are toxic, and they kill people and they kill animals um, if you ingest these toxins. They're as, as toxic as cobra venom. It's not really a, a well-known fact, but if you had to drink a water with a glass of water of cyanotoxins or even a few mills, you would actually die. Uh, now, obviously, humans don't often do that, but dogs do, and sheep and cattle. And so we often see, um, you know, herds of cattle or sheep actually dying from cyanobacteria uh, toxins. So it's it's a severe problem. We've got climate warming. It's you know the lakes lakes around the world are heavily impacted by pollution and climate. Uh, warming and other forces. So this is an overview of the, the problems that, we, that we're experiencing in lakes worldwide. And so it, it, you also have to think about what are the internal problems and what are the external problems. So the cyanobacteria bloom is the external problem. But when you start trying to sell something, something to a, a product to a company, you've got to think about what internal problems they have. It's very expensive to collect water samples. Um, it's, there's a slow turnaround time between the time it takes them to sample and get the analysis results. Um, there's a lack of coherent information. Um, uh, when it comes to water companies, um, there's a whole diverse range of different types of information they can draw on, and, and, and that information is scattered and, and, in, and in, you know, information overload, but, but not enough information to actually make decisions. So you've got to think about not only the external problems, but the internal problems of your customers. So at a water company, the internal problems might be, they don't have time to collect the samples. They don't have the budget to go out and collect the necessary information. So all of these are internal problems that you need to think about as well. So just to give you a bit of background about Sino Lakes, um, I submitted a business competition idea back in 2014 to the Copernicus Master Ideas Challenge. That competition is actually still running. And I'd encourage you to Google it, Copernicus Masters. Maybe you could submit your idea into that competition as well. Um, we then uh, founded um, the company in 2015, and we proceeded to get R&D and technology development grants funded from the government. Now, unfortunately, um, there's a sort of perception that, well, it, it won't take much work. We can just hack together a solution in five minutes and it, sh it should be good enough. Well. Unfortunately, when it comes to earth observation and deep, what we call deep tech, the reason it's deep tech is that it actually takes a long time to develop the technology um, and to do the R&D. So there's no shortcuts in this process. You still have to do hard R&D to actually ensure that the information that you're delivering is accurate. And so government grants is obviously a, gr a great way to do that. 2016, we delivered an MVP to the National Department of Water and Sanitation. Here's a second learning that I can give you. Always build your solution around a customer. Never build your solution without a customer. Uh, you have to have a customer embedded in your technology from the very beginning. Otherwise, you're going to develop something that's useful to no one. Uh, we then commercialized the web app and launched it to the co commercial market in 2018. Note that that's three years after we founded the business. 
this is another thing with deep tech. Um, there's a perception that, oh, I should just be able to hack together an app or something in five minutes and, you know, sell it online the next day. Well, actually, it took us three years to get our way back out into the commercial market. Uh, we then proceeded with technology trials and pilots with utilities in South Africa, Australia, USA, Europe, and wherever we could find them, really. And those were met with different levels of success. Um, this is another learning is that don't expect you to put your technology in front of a customer and for them to just fall over and give you money. Uh, it doesn't work like that. The real world people buy products for a, a number of very different reasons and it's often not the reason that you think they're going to buy it. And there's also a learning in there is just because you have a great technology doesn't mean someone's going to buy it from you, unfortunately. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, so 2020, we were funded to develop further technology, which was a mobile application, uh, which we got developed again through government grants and funding. And we then released our mobile application, which uses APIs that, that rest on top of our initial web application. So in other words, we built technology on technology, and that's why it takes time to build technologies. Um, we then did uh, some technology demonstrators with the three largest water companies in South Africa over the period of a year, validating all the information with them, working closely with them to improve the technology, scoping what they needed, how they needed, and why they needed it, and delivering it around their specific problems that they had. This is another important thing is to pilot your technology and find people that can adopt your technology early on in your journey and to use them to refine and improve your, your product offering and really get to understand their problems and what they need. So over that time, we actually developed a whole bunch of features in the technology, which is unrelated to satellite remote sensing because we identified significant uh, opportunities that go beyond remote sensing. And this is rare, really where the value add is actually the merging of data streams, of EO data streams and other data streams together. It's not enough just to provide EO data. You've also got to uh, leverage and merge data sources from diverse um, uh, sources. And uh, 2022, where we currently sit, we founded Sun Lakes Australia and we have growing mobile app users and um, yeah, future and beyond. So just to give you a quick overview of the technology itself, I've got about seven more minutes. So what does it do? Our web application is designed for water companies. We provide actionable information for decision making and operational tasks, primarily for water professionals, uh, water quality professionals, biologists, uh, people who are concerned and managing lakes. And what some of their main concerns in those lakes is cyanobacteria blooms. So we do this through different features within the product. We have a dashboard with integrates information to provide key metrics for decision-making. Now dashboards are all the rage, but you need to know how to present that dashboard, what information your customer really wants to know. Um, we have data upload and visualization tools. As I mentioned before, it's not enough to just do EO. You've got to also um, embed yourself within the customer's data ecosystem. Uh, some of the key features that our customers really use are alerts and updates. And this is often sent by email and also now available through the mobile app. We generate reports using the data from EO. And this is an important requirement for the customer because they're using reporting. Um, one of their main tasks is to report on water quality in their, in their lakes. So this is an important feature for them. Of course, there's the charts, the time series tool, the map. You, can you note that not one of the things I've mentioned is, is earth observation imagery. <laughs> That's because it's very easy to look at a map with earth observation imagery. It's a completely other thing to create value from that image. Okay. So this is an example of the, some of the water companies that we've piloted this technology with. The pilots were normally four to six months. And I say that's a major mistake that we made. It takes years for a business to change the way they do something. And when you have a disruptive technology, like our technology is disruptive because it changes the way these teams have been operating for the last 30, 40 years. They've been operating exactly the same way. All of a sudden, they've got, they're overwhelmed by the amount of data that we can provide them from EO and they don't know what to do. And so if you're piloting your technology, the, and if it's disruptive and if it's going to change the behavior of a customer or a team, 
you need to pilot that technology for at least 12 months because it takes at least 12 months or even 18 or 24 months for a customer to change the way they've been operating from the past and also to build confidence in your product. So this is some feedback from customers that from a Hunter Water Corporation here in Australia. And uh, you, you can read that, <clears throat> um, how this product is providing value. And the effective main value add is that it provides advanced warning. Now with any EO application, um, we've got massive amounts of data stream, but I would say that a huge amount of where the value of EO is gonna come from in um, both now and in future is gonna be forecasting. If we're able to forecast using EO data streams, we can now start providing real value to different customers. So think about how you're gonna develop models and strategies for forecasting with EO data. And you can see from this that the customer mentions their problems. What are their problems? Microsystem taste and odor contamination issues. But the other problem is they need sufficient time for operational decision-making. That's effectively what you're giving them. You're giving them a head start so that nothing takes them by surprise. Uh, this is a quick overview of the Sun Lakes web app, which you can download free on the app and Google Play stores. And the whole idea of this is to um, access a completely different market from the enterprise market utilities. And that's another quick um, learning that we've had is you've got to diversify your product offering and ensure that you can meet more than one customer. But initially, don't try to meet more than one customer. Do it with one customer first, one type of product. Don't try to hit three or four customers at the same time. And in other words, different segments. Try to nail one segment and then start to diversify your offering um, from there. So this is our attempt to diversify our offering into the general market where concerned citizens or you know, people using lakes for recreation can access this information in a weather type format and optionally choose to get you know, high resolution satellite maps, et cetera. So uh, this is a way that we have effectively taken the technology and made it available to anyone on earth. This is the only app currently available anywhere in the world that monitors any lake on the earth in an automated and routine fashion um, like this. And here's an example of some of the growth we've been seeing since we launched the product. So we currently with more than a thousand installs across the two operating systems. It's not a huge number. We need to grow a lot more here in Australia, in the US, in different markets. But it also gives you an appreciation that just because you have an app on the app store doesn't mean it's going to be an instant success. Everything takes time. Um, I was actually looking um, on Elon Musk's Twitter feed last night, and it was 16 years ago that they launched the first Tesla Roadster. So we think to ourselves, if you look at the value of Tesla stock 16 years ago, it was like <laughs> probably a 20th or 30th of what it's worth now. So if you had invested in Tesla stock 16 years ago, you would be a rich person right now. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. But it just shows you that his launch, product launch was 16 years ago. Our product launch was two years ago. So it, it just shows you that these things take time. So please uh, follow us on Twitter at Sino Lakes. Uh, we'll post technology updates there and thoughts. Um, you're welcome to reach out for me to me if you want any advice or questions. But um, yeah, thanks for listening to me today. Cheers. Back to you, Roshni. Thank you very much, Mark. That was very, very interesting. And my goodness, the range of potential applications is very big. Um, we will hold questions for Mark until the end of this session. Um, and so I now welcome Nicholas Suter from Conservation International to speak as well. Thank you again, Mark. Over to you, Nick. 
Thank you, uh, Roshni. Um, I will attempt to share my screen. And, oops, um, all right. Uh, now, are you all seeing the... All right, good. So yes, as, uh, as Roshni said, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak at this um, this event. So I'll be offering a, a slightly different perspective, um, I think, to some of the other speakers. Uh, we have more of a you know, multifaceted uh, problem with our development work on um, the Tonle Sap Lake in Cambodia. And there's multiple ways in which, <clears throat> excuse me, um, earth observations could be of use. So I'm the freshwater director uh, for Cambodia and we'll be looking at earth observations and uh, building resilience, um, families and fisheries resilience building model in Cambodia's Tonle Sap Lake. So the Tonle Sap Lake, you can see it there um, in the very middle of Cambodia um, in the, the red box. Uh, it's the world's largest reverse flow freshwater lake. So it has a very unique hydrology. During the wet season, the water flows down um, from China, Laos, Thailand, and parts of Vietnam into Cambodia, down the Mekong, and actually flows back up into the Tonle Sap Lake. So it reverses flow, fills the lake, and then in the dry season, um, that flow actually reverses again and the lake empties. So the lake itself, uh, you, can, you can see it there. Um, the uh, green on the outside, uh, that's the floodplain. So we've got the blue in the middle and then there's the, the dark green areas. That's uh, flooded forest and grassland. So that's the extent of the flood in the wet season. And it fills by, at its steepest point, up to seven metres. It's uh, Cambodia's most important natural resource. Um, and um, because it's home to one of the world's largest inland fisheries. So the uh, fishery of the whole Mekong is valued at billions of dollars and the Tonle Sap is a large part of that. And this fishery directly supports over 1 million people. And there's numerous people that live on the lake in floating houses. Um, and that's, that's how they make their livelihood. So this is the, uh, the CI team. That's just a quick shot of us out in the field in May. Um, surveying some of our revegetation work. So our philosophy here with our, our model is uh, we want we implement the families and fisheries resilience building model to improve people's livelihoods and build resilient communities. And by doing that, we want to reduce the pressure on and also improve the ecosystem of the lake that supports them. So these people uh, live in floating villages. They don't have any land and majority don't have any land and fishing is the core of their livelihood. So without a healthy fishery, um, they're not going to do very well. And we develop an integrated program, we implemented integrated program. We look at people's livelihoods, improving sustainable finance, improving their governance and governance of the whole system and also conservation of their natural resources. Now, Conservation International, we've been working on the Tonle Sap since 2006. Um, and in two provinces, Persat, which is at the bottom of the lake in the picture there, and Kampong Tom at the top. Now, we've implemented our full program in 10 community fisheries. So these are groups of citizen volunteers, so local people who are authorised by the government to manage their fishery and an area of land and, and often lake. So... The polygons that you can see there are community fishery areas and the beige ones are the ones that we have been working in. Um, we've also implemented parts of the program in three villages that aren't associated with community fisheries and we're expanding now to eight new community fisheries um, and that's uh, not quite on the map but it's just a bit further off to the left there's another cluster of CFIs that we're starting to look at working with. So to look at livelihoods, we want to increase income and reduce debt. We do that by improving people's financial literacy and adding value uh, to their processed fish. We primarily work uh, with women's groups. Um, so there's elements of uh, women's empowerment in this and also largely in uh, Cambodian culture, it's the women who manage uh, the money within the family. And they also generate the value added wealth through the fish processing. 
So we work with women's saving groups, women's fish processing groups, and the picture here shows some dried fish that our group in Arcol has produced. And then on top of that, there's women's marketing groups that get these processed products to market. Now for fish processing, the two major areas we work in are fermented um, and smoked fish. So the fermented fish is the delicacy known as brahok, and you've seen the smoked fish. And we mostly work around improving hygiene. Um, generally, it's very poor when people just do it in their own families. Uh, quality ingredients, we make sure they use better ingredients. Quality control, so that they're selling a, a quality product. And then we increase market access. You can see here the, the finished uh, product marketed on hygiene. Sustainable finance, so we work with women saving groups. As I said, these, most of these people are landless, so they can't get uh, formal loans through banks. They've got no collateral. So the women pull their savings and then uh, they use that to fund their fishing activities and other small business activities. Now we top that up with a conservation fund of one to one and a half thousand dollars. And the interest on that is used by the community fishery organization to fund either uh, firefighting activities, fire management or conservation. But they have to apply to the women to get that money. So it's the uh, often the husbands having to apply for their the money from the wives. That's why they're possibly so happy. Also to manage the community fishery organizations, we provide them with a $5,000 um, conservation trust fund. We've provided that to eight CFIs. This goes into a term deposit and the interest is used to fund them and implement their management plan. It's not enough to do everything, but it attracts extra funding and keeps them, keeps them going. For governance, there's a needs to be strong relationships with the local government. Uh, so at the district, local district and provincial level, and we've set up fisheries coordination teams. So these are meetings that link CFIs, so multiple CFIs together with multiple layers of government. So usually at the district level first, and then the provincial level. So provincial is about the same level as state in Australia. And they collaborate to solve fisheries issues. And also this is proven to provide extra funding to the CFIs. So for conservation, the areas are, you saw those polygons and they're divided up into community fishery zones. And these are open access. Um, but they have rules on the, on the type of fishing nets that can be used. And so the CFIs and local authorities patrol these for illegal activity. So you can see here with the CFI, members in collaboration with fisheries authority are removing illegal fishing nets. The core of these areas is a community conservation zone, which is close to fishing. This is most important in the dry season because it's their community fish refuge. And we're working to make sure that there's continued presence of you know, threatened species within their areas. We've also implemented community-based fire management. So they undertake fire management planning, disseminate information to local and migrant fishers on what is and isn't allowed. Basically not setting fire to the forest isn't allowed. Threat reduction, and they'll patrol for wildfires. We issue wildfire alerts, I'll come to that later. And then if there are fires, they put them out. Conservation, we've done a lot of replanting of the flooded forest. Um, we've got a big program there to replant potentially a thousand hectares over the next five years. And that's some of the statistics. There are synergies in our program. So the fuel efficient smoking stoves produce a better quality product, improve livelihoods, but it uses less wood uh, from the forest. And we teach them how to ha sustainably harvest the wood. So we get a livelihood and conservation payoff by using these fuel efficient um, smoking stoves. So for earth observation, we have been using it. I'll look at the use, the promise and, and some of the limitations in the remaining time. I guess our main use so far has been threat detection. So we're going to start trialing uh, monitoring for deforestation using the Global Forest Watch um, app that'll be starting this year. And, but we have trialed fire alert monitoring. So we started using the NASA firm system, but that had to be monitored daily by our staff. We've gone over to Aurora Tech, which is a commercial uh, based operation, and then Global Forest Watch have a fire app that they're launching. So we'll try that. Early detection of fires has proved to be very useful, um, but 
and getting automated alerts uh, from Aurora Tech is good. We get them via email and then forward them onto the communities. The ability to provide text messages didn't work this year. Uh, issues, uh, we got a lot of false positives. Um, so we could sort through them before we sent them to the communities, but the communities getting a whole lot of false positives might undermine uh, the use of the system and also expensive. So Aurora Tech is a commercial service and um, in the long run will prove to be too expensive. But all the fires detected this year were first detected by the satellite system before the community knew they were there. So they were able to put them out very quickly. We want to look at the ecological uh, integrity of the CFI area. So we want to determine that using the essential biodiversity variable framework. And that's part of the uh, GEO Group on Earth observation, um, I guess, collaboration. So we're aligning it to that. Um, we have been trying to assess flooded forest community structure. Uh, the vegetation community is quite diverse and change over time. So I've had an intern looking at doing this with some satellite imagery. You can see the planet imagery at the top. Uh, so I think that's 30 or maybe 10 meter resolution um, from Kampong Crack CFI. And then using some ground truthing, there's a you know, classified the vegetation and that seems a pretty good classification, but we need extensive ground truthing uh, this classification seems to fall apart the further away we get from Kampong Prak, and it just doesn't work seasonally. Um, because the flood, the amount of water, I think, in the system changes so dramatically over the year, uh, this really throws out um, ability to classify vegetation. So you can just see June to December in 2019 and 2020, using the same algorithm, the same uh, training set, you know, actual data, we know where the vegetation types are, just comes up with completely different results uh, for vegetation classification. So there's big problems there. And that renders a lot of the global products. So we've used Hansen Global Forest Watch to look at deforestation. Um, so I'm, you know, lost a lot of trust in that. And also I had a look at, I think there was a new Google um, World Resources Institute land cover product. And again, that didn't, uh, didn't seem to be very accurate. So we need very local solutions for this unique environment. So there are good opportunities, uh, you know, for looking at ecological integrity. So we would like to combine our on ground assessment. We monitor our threatened species using camera traps, uh, the communities under, undertake um, the smart patrolling. So there's the smart patrolling app, the, the data all goes into that. You know, they record their tracks um, and where they find illegal activity and uh, animals of interest. And we've also got spatial data of their daily fish catch monitoring. So local fishers go out and record the top five species they catch every day and the total weight. So we'd like to be able to use, you know, and Potentially we can take more finer scale drone imagery. Um, it'd be good to model or identify important habitat within each community fishery area. So again, um, another component is these uh, habitats are now fragmented because a lot of land clearance, a lot of burning, the bigger trees in some areas have gone. So it'd be good to look at uh, vegetation fragmentation during the annual floods. So, we have uh, one species, the hairy-nosed otter, which is endangered and very um, rarely known, which relies on emergent trees that stick out of the flood water during the floods to move between. So, you know, large areas without these trees is a uh, suboptimal habitat for them. So we'd like to understand fragmentation, um, understanding the spatial and temporal assessment fire regimes uh, within the lake would also be of great interest and use. And we want to be able to assess our flooded forest restoration efforts. Um, it's very time consuming and difficult to go out and set uh, ground-based quadrats uh, for a lot of vegetation um, assessment. So remote sensing would be for, good for that. The main messages I want to get across from this is that we operate at local level and we support local community fisheries. So everything is very local in what we do. To do that, we need meso and micro scale data. data. 
um, to assess community fisheries, assess their ecological integrity, and then make decisions. Um, these decisions will be to help prioritise uh, high biodiversity community fisheries to work with initially, and then within them, uh, the management priorities within those community fisheries. So it can help immensely with spatial mapping and priority setting. Um, and uh, we also, the, these areas are very high in carbon and they're quite carbon rich, but that's uh, directly related to the vegetation type. So the um, standing forests have more carbon than the shrubland, which has more carbon than burnt areas. So to be able to undertake accurate carbon stock assessments and work out financing, we need to be able to uh, use earth observation to be able to collect that data. So that's all, thank you. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to get in touch, any ready solutions, there's my um, email contact there. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Nick. So we will now, um, allow uh, the, we'll pass the floor over to our two colleagues from the University of Hassanuddin. Uh, so we have joining us uh, Professor Roland Barkey and um, his colleague, um, Dr. I'm just going to find him so we can ask Dr. Andam. Yes. Andam. Andam. There we go, Dr. Andam. So um, welcome and over to both of you. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rosni, for uh, letting us uh, present our work. And uh, our topic is Earth Observations for Climate Resilience. And entering point for the study, we use case study in adaptation and mitigations of shallowing, of shallow uh, and flooding in uh, Lake Tempe and surrounding area based on the water set charging in the lake and also the problem of the climate in the future. Next, Panda. So briefly, this is our uh, team. We have 10 uh, person in our team diff from different uh, domain of knowledge. Next, Panda. I will do it in five minutes, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, okay. this is uh, our case study area. Yeah, you can see in the uh, there are two lakes that uh, in the flooding season it become one. Lake Tempe itself the biggest, and then there is the uh, Lake Sidenreng, and other lake is uh, Lake Buaya. And all these three lakes uh, depend on the water set. The condition of the lake depends on the water set. There are two main water sets. Walanai water set in the south and Pila water set in the north. And also small water set in the uh, western part, for example, for these uh, lakes. Uh, then Panda will uh, give you some overview of the study of these uh, small water sets. Next, Panda. Now, uh, together with CSIRO, we develop a research roadmap. So in the first step, we will learn about ODC and how to use ODC. Yeah. Uh, and then the next step, we will learn about the climate uh, uh, resilience, climate resilience, yeah, uh, entering to the observation, uh, earth observation problem in that area. And we are doing right now that, that second steps. And the third step, we will develop a uh, dashboard to make it easier to use, especially for the local government, because we want to uh, help the local government to set up the regional planning, how to mitigate and adapt it to the uh, problem of Lake Tempe. Since years, uh, they have the, the problem, and every year they have flood but nothing can be done so far. And then at the next step, we will uh, develop uh, a study program, a study, uh, study center at Hassanuddin University 
so we can enlarge our area not only for the uh, uh, case study area but also for other enlarge for other uh, aspects like at like coastal management, coastal problem, and also in the marine science. Okay, next, Pak Anda. Yeah. So for the first, we, we uh, have an, several workshops for the introduction of ODC. Yeah. You can see here, we our team will uh, follow the, our will, our team followed the, the workshop, yeah, already. And then next panda, yeah. And then after the workshop, we had a, a training sessions nearly every week, yeah, from maybe October to December with the CSIRO team. So the CSIRO team teach us how to use the ODC, yeah for Earth observation in Lake Tempe. So we begin with Lake Tempe. Next one. Now, after we understand uh, what, how to use the ODC, then we uh, provide training to the, our students. Yeah, at least uh, last year, about 125 students already have the trainings about how to use ODC. And right now, some of them already use it for their research uh, thesis and uh, dissertation, for example. Next one. Yeah, we, our term is socialization, but it is a dissemination of ODC to the local governments. And there are many positive response from the government, yeah, especially to manage the lake of Tempe and the surrounding area for flooding. Uh, that's why we then understand that we have to make it easier to use. So we would like to develop a dashboard. Yeah? So it will be menu driven. Yeah? Then the, the local government can use it also to use the information to their regional uh, planning. Next, Banda. Yeah. To, uh, to make it more accurate, yeah. So we have to do or to connect the field uh, problem or the field uh, characteristic with the observation from the Earth, yeah, from the satellite, for example. So we develop here uh, some uh, survey with our students, of course, yeah, not only on the lake, but also on the uh, conditions of the water set. We would like uh, we are going right now to use the model of soil and water assessment tools to manage the sedimentation and the uh, discharge that caused the flooding in, in surrounded area of the Lake Tempe. Uh, it's, it's undergoing right now the study uh, we develop further. Okay, like the next slide. Yeah. Now we will hear from Pa Andang what is the results of our study on the collaborative uh, study with Desiro. Please, Pa Andang, it's your time. Oh, okay, thank you, Dr. Roland. So uh, here we will present what are the results of the collaborative activity with the Cicero last, or yes, last year. So uh, from the first time, we uh, exercise about the platform of Open Data Cube uh, by supporting from CSIRO and thanks to Matt and uh, Ronnie and Eric and also Amelia and Amy. Uh, in here, we try, try to use the uh, platform by Jupiter Lab. So the first, uh, we study about how to monitor the water body. So from uh, this data, we uh, the CSIRO already support uh, the imaging, uh, like the Sentinel-2 and uh, also Lancet and uh, Himawari. 
So uh, the result by monitoring the uh, tempelex, also we can see this. Uh, the tempelex is uh, uh, not too many uh, the chlorophyll in, in January because it's too many uh, sedimentation in this area. So uh, by measuring sedimentation in Lake Tempe, it's also uh, generated from uh, multi-temporal sedimentation in work time about uh, uh, only done in two hours. Uh, if we, we do, if we compare with uh, download the data, download the image, maybe we need uh, more than a week or more two or three weeks, and also a month to analyze and we get the data like this. So. Uh, by only to uh, do it in two hours, we can uh, see this uh, uh, measuring sedimentation in Tempe Lakes. In January, is the highest uh, sedimentation uh, in Tempe. We can see in the uh, right uh, left corner, in the top, in the January, is uh, the highest sedimentation. And in February, we can see the accumulation of sedimentation will enter to the uh, Dano. So, uh, in Dano Temp, in Tempe Lakes. So, if we see this one, it's very easy uh, in, and faster with using the Open Data Cube. And what can we done with the Open Data Cube? Uh, with Open Data Cube, we can increase collaboration with other research for algorithm development. So, it's not also in sedimentation, but we can do it in geology or in uh, 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 fishery and, and others. Open Data Cube technology is innovation in weeks. It's not innovation for a month or another. It's, it's very easy uh, to do the uh, in Open Data Cube uh, like as we already know by uh, supervised by Matt, uh, Eric, and Ronnie. Uh, and uh, from that, we try to improve the data accuracy by taking the data from the field and combine between the uh, data from an Open Data Cube. So, and the next step, we try to develop of the syllabus or Indonesian or even Asia digital uh, art dashboard to make it easy for the uh, customer to see uh, uh, how about the Indonesian or syllabus. And the next uh, step, maybe we try to marketing uh, the art digital syllabus platform to the government, NGO, and other partners. That uh, we, what we can do with uh, Open Data Cube. So uh, the development and utilization of Open Data Cube that can be done uh, with our students that uh, Mr. Ro uh, Dr. Roland has been saying, uh, by using the Open Data Cube, we, we can uh, download it, we can make it the uh, series of the land cover. So uh, we can see the small uh, water seat uh, around the uh, Tempe is a batu batu water seat. Uh, the student uh, take the a series of a land cover uh, data uh, from the open data cube and use the hydraulical modeling uh, to determine the sedimentation uh, around the uh, what, uh, batu batu water sea. And this the sedimentation level that uh, already researched by our students. We can see uh, the sedimentation in nearest to the river is uh, is the more higher than uh, far from the rivers. And also, uh, we can, uh, with the climate data that can be extracted by the Open Data Cube, uh, it's possible to simulate the flooding disaster. So this uh, the uh, another biggest uh, water sheet, uh, below water sheet. So we can uh, generate uh, this data. We can see the image in the left, in the right, it's, uh, uh, about the flooding from 2018. And we can see how the, uh, flooding will uh, done in two uh, in 10 years 20 years and 25 so by that thing using open data cube will really make easy uh, for us uh, in indonesia uh, especially in south sulawesi the center of indonesia uh, to analyze about uh, the uh, situation or the climate in uh, in the fast time in the very fast in fast then uh, don't let the data uh, by manually. I think that's all for our presentation. Mr. Roland, maybe one sentence or to finish this presentation. Oh, thank you, Pandan. Thank you, Rosni. We 
with uh, when when there will be a guest questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, both of you. I'd now like to welcome our other two presenters back on stage with us to join Roland and Andan. So um, Mark and Nick, please join us and we welcome questions from the audience. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat or to unmute and ask them directly. So to begin with, we have one question that's in the chat. Is it possible to distinguish between spawning and catchable fish zones? I believe that this is to you, Nick. Yes, thank you. Um, so there are some projects uh, on the Tonless app at the moment that uh, under, I think it's the Wonders of the Mekong uh, program, that are looking at determining, you know, important areas of fish within the floodplain. So areas where there's spawning, um, you know, yeah, particularly spawning aggregations of fish, uh, you know, nurseries for small larvae and sites like that. So that information is, again, with all of this, it's, it's time consuming and, um, you know, it costs a lot to actually collect. So to be able to, you know, if possible, if possible, you can correlate this sort of data with, you know, larger earth observation data and then use that, um, you know, for spatial planning would be very useful. But we are starting to understand that, you know, the spatial complexity of the, uh, of the floodplain is, you know, very important for fish as well. And that's something that needs to be, needs to be managed. Thank you very much, Nick. We have um, a question here from Jay Rick, who's asking if, who says uh, the case study presented were very interesting and informative, and they are wondering if they uh, could have copies of the methodology um, to, of, on the basis to conduct similar studies in their own countries. Would the speakers like to um, comment on that? Do you advise that anyone interested get in contact with you yeah it is possible because we have our uh, proposal for example they can learn from our proposal how to develop a proposal and then to do the research yeah it's for Lake Tempe only for Lake Tempe but further on we will do it for other area also it's possible and then if you want uh, pa Andang or other teams will send you the paper or the the proposal. And yeah, uh, if, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Anna, yeah, please. I, yeah, please. All right, uh, thank you. you. Thanks, Roland. I would say that um, you can also, if you're looking to um, understand more about our methodology for identifying cyanobacteria, uh, we have several publications available um, underlying the scientific methodology, and you can find those uh, some of those on our website. Um, yeah, as for our work on the top tap, we are in the process of drawing it all together, um, you know, as an information resource, explaining how we, you know, implement all of this. So. That's, uh, that's still under development. So as you'd appreciate, there's, there's quite a lot that we've done over 10 years. So it's taking uh, quite a while to get it all together. Thank you all. And uh, a recommendation to any of our audience who are interested, please do feel free to email any of our speakers directly to get more information. Um, we will be happy to put you in contact with them and so please feel free to email me and I'll be very happy to contact I'll put you in contact with them directly. We have a really great question here from Akash who says a very practical question here do any of you have tips on how we can identify gaps where we can use earth observation data to um, develop products since today there are so many products out there and software is already available. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I could I could try have a go at that. Um, I think that it's all about identifying a problem for a customer. Um, it doesn't really matter that Google Earth Engine exists. It doesn't really matter that Sentinel Hub exists. And, you know, you can spin up an application on an API in an hour. Um, what's significant is your relationship with your customer. Um, what's significant is solving something for them. And so don't be discouraged. Um, it, you know, it also, it also, the opportunities also come out of doing the research and development yourself. You might discover something that someone else can't do or doesn't know how to do yet. Um, and you can use that as a competitive advantage to offer something that someone else is not currently offering. Um, you know, the existence of, of Google Earth and these other API-based Earth observation like um, AWS or Amazon, uh, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're creating value for specific customers. They, they're desperately trying to create value for customers. Um, you know, so... It, it's all about figuring out who you're trying to help with what. Um, so I'd say start there, use the tools that are available to you and uh, see how far you get. Yeah, from our uh, perspective, a lot of it is almost directed luck uh, that you'll find these things. So the Aurora Tech, uh, the satellite service, um, I became aware of that by attending a, an online, I think it was called Firecast. So it was a, a trade show for, you know, for fire suppression. 99.9% um, .9 of that was of absolutely no use to us whatsoever because it was all sophisticated first world tech equipment that we could, you know, our communities can't afford, et cetera, et cetera, but these guys were on. Um, and then sort of leading on the uh, existence of the Global Forest Watcher Fire app, which has been developed, was just me. I think I was preparing a proposal and I needed to look at their website for the address and I stumbled across that. So um it's it's the problem of there is just so much stuff out there you you can't it's impossible to keep track of everything so there's unfortunately there's just a lot of luck involved but you have to be open to <laughs> to being lucky put yourself yeah luck luck plays a big role <laughs> for sure Wonderful. Thank you very much. Would our colleagues from UNHAS like to add anything to that? Uh, for us, we use all. It means uh, we learn about the ODC, but also we uh, look at the Earth, about GE, yeah? Google Earth Engine, yeah, and then how we can integrate it in the ODC so we can develop further our algorithm because uh, the problem is what algorithm should be developed to fulfill our needs. That, uh, that's uh, uh, in our experience. So we understand first from ODC, we consult also the GEE and then how to uh, improve our work with the algorithms. I think that's uh, my uh, answer, yeah. Thank you very much. Can I add a little bit? Uh, Please. <laughs> so I think it's the same with uh, Dr. Roland say, uh, the using, uh, we also using the Google engine in Open Data Cube because the language is the same. So it's uh, very easy to us to uh, compile that, uh, the data. I think that's awesome. Thank you. In, in Python language, I'd say that. Thank you very much. We have time for one last question before we have a quick break, and then we move on to the networking session of our program today. So this last question is um, specifically directed to Mark. However, I do think it's relevant to all of our speakers. 
Have you found any significant differences in the key problems and questions between your customers in Australia versus Southeast Asia? Uh, yeah, so we had uh, trials run by Manila Water in the Philippines. They're in Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. think so. <laughs> uh, yeah. We had Manila Water and um, there's, there's another company there that also had a look at it. They had quite specific requirements around high resolution imagery that we weren't able to fulfill at the time. Um, but effectively, um, you know, fortunately for us, the problem that water companies are facing with cyanobacteria in their sources, it is a global problem. And that's because of the nature of cyanobacteria occurs effectively. It's a global issue. Um, you, you might have a problem that's a localized problem. It may only occur in one or two places. Um, but for us, this is a global issue. And so, but I would have, I would say that um, our experience interacting with customers in the US versus Australia versus South Africa is always very different. And they think differently and they're driven by different things. And it requires interacting with them in, in quite different ways. Um, and so if you are wanting to be successful, um, you know, selling a product in different markets, different countries, um, you know, there's a concept of the market that you can actually reach and the, the global market. So us as Sinolex, we could probably only really reach the market in a few places and we would need to engage with partners in order to be successful in a place like Southeast Asia. Um, you know, I wouldn't think that I would be very successful just calling up a whole bunch of water companies in Southeast Asia and we haven't been successful with that. So it's also about finding the right partners so that you can translate your technology into different markets. And we're still very much on that journey. Um, I might have given the idea that we're successful and profitable and growing and all of that. That's not actually true. <laughs> we're just still very early phase. Um, we have some great technology. It works great. Uh, we have some happy customers, but we're very far away from, from achieving um, you know, a great degree of market penetration or um, a large number of users all around the world. But that's the goal, obviously. But we see partnering with people in different regions as a key uh, to succeeding in bringing our technology to Southeast Asia or different regions around the world. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Did any of our other speakers want to say anything along those lines as well? No problems. Well, thank you both very, oh, thank you all four of you very much. It's been a very delightful um, hour. The time has flown by and it's been such a delight to listen to what you've had to explain about your use cases, your journeys, the things that inspire you and what you enjoy about working with earth observation data in relation to climate change. So thank you all. Um, we'll now take a short uh, five minute comfort break. So I'll see you back, everybody who would like to stay for the networking. We'll see you back in five minutes at uh, 10 past one Sydney time, and we'll begin the networking session. So these networking sessions today will be quite different from what we did yesterday. We will focus on the challenge theme areas and there will be a member of the hackathon organizing team within each of these um, challenge theme area breakout rooms. And we invite you to join the rooms. You'll be able to move across between the rooms as you like, but within each room, we'll help people to network and find a, a group essentially. So this is going to be potentially the second most useful session today after today's keynote session that we just finished. We'll see you back here in five minutes. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Rosny. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. See you.